Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Bellavo, and um, I'm the executive director and president of um, these two organizations, Environmental Health Strategy Center and Prevent Harm. Check us out on the web. We're a nonprofit, a public health organization. We're headquartered in Portland, Maine, but we work both in the state and nationally. And our mission is to ensure that uh, all people are healthy and, thr and thriving in a fair and healthy economy. And we do that through environmental health programs and sustainable economy programs. And I'm going to talk to you today about some of our environmental public health work related to uh, chemical hazards in the home and um, what we can do to uh, protect ourselves and our, our family's health. So as we're, there's a bunch of different topics here, um, all of which we could talk about at length. So if you see something that you want to ask about or comment on, just raise your hand and we'll talk about uh, whatever you're most interested in. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll breeze through a bunch of different topics. Um, if I get cooperation here. You want to prevent hand because I really oh, Very interesting typo. <laughs> prevent harm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, unless you're vegetarian. Okay, so we'll start. Um, uh, with lead poisoning prevention, something you've heard about, you may have worked on. Uh, we won't dwell on this topic, but uh, just to know that the um, uh, perhaps still the greatest and oldest of environmental health hazards um, is due to the element lead. If you live in a, a home uh, built before 1978, uh, you may likely have lead paint in that home. If your home is older, it was built before 1946, it almost certainly contains lead paint. And you don't have to have peeling and crumbling, blistering paint to have virtually invisible lead dust, even from the opening of windows and, and doors. And it's still a, a very serious source of, of childhood lead poisoning, particularly in urban areas of the state like Lewiston and Auburn. And it's also an occupational hazard because if you renovate, if you do it yourself or if you hire somebody to renovate and you disturb uh, that lead paint, there's going to be exposure unless you um, use lead safe practices. So <clears throat> um, that's not the only concern with lead. Um, this shows a success story. Uh, there used to be lead and gasoline in, in the United States until 1978. And over this 30-year uh, period, we saw a 90% reduction in the amount of lead in the ambient air, uh, attributable to the phase-out of lead as an additive, tetraethyl lead, in gasoline in the United States. People are still working in other countries to complete the phase-out of lead in gasoline. It's a major source of lead poisoning. Uh, and unfortunately, lead in fuel is still used, uh, still uses an aviation fuel for small airplanes. So we have 20,000 small airports around the country, every one of which is a source of lead poisoning because they continue the use of this element. So it's, it's an unsolved problem, but what this illustrates is that when you go to the source and you safely substitute uh, out of the offending material, you get dramatic public health uh, improvement. This is represented by the reduction in the concentration in the air, but also if we had a, another chart showing concentration in uh, children or adult blood, you would see a decline over that time, also largely attributable uh, to the, the reduction in, in the use in uh, gasoline. Lead, new lead paint was also banned in 1978. Yes? Why is there still lead at these small airports? Do they just not have access to the fuel or the planes to uh, aviation fuel, lead in aviation fuel is not yet regulated. Uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is still looking at it. Um, uh, there should be substitutes. It's an anti-knocking agent in old engines. Um, and uh, it's a matter of uh, retrofitting fuel and, and uh, there's no market incentive to switch out on it on your own. So we need, we need government regulation in that case. Uh, so, um, but still, as you probably heard this year in the news, there's concern remaining about lead in our drinking water. Um, it's, a, it's an issue for Maine because a fair amount of our water supply, particularly if it's groundwater, is relatively on the corrosive side. 
So it'll tend to pull lead out of lead solder and copper pipes uh, in various old fixtures. Um, there are uh, service lines in Maine for public water supplies that are still uh, lead-based. This was the problem in Flint, Michigan, uh, where highly corrosive water was introduced through old lead pipes, and that water still is not potable to this day. Well, another aspect that people don't realize is that it was only uh, until 2014 that low lead uh, fixtures were introduced into the marketplace. So if you have a so-called brass fixture faucet, brass, uh, the red brass used up until 2014 contains 8% lead. And even the newly compliant fixtures only introduced a couple years ago still have uh, up to a percent or two of lead. And so the old, old brass fixtures, again with corrosive water, will uh, leach the lead out of the fixture. So everyone actually should, that would be a good project to do around campus actually, test the various water fountains or water supplies for lead. You can, uh, you want to take a first draw first thing in the morning before lots of water has passed through the system. And you can, uh, there's a, you can get a state, through the state lab you can get a test kit for $20 to measure the lead in uh, drinking water. Still a major uh, source of exposure. So lead is the oldest environmental health hazard. Uh, we've known about lead poisoning for some 2,000 years, yes? So let's say I were about to move into a house built in 1900. Yeah. What if there's a lot of lead in it? Do I put a filter on it? In the, in the water? In the water? Uh, yes, it can be filtered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can also replace, if it, you have to sort of investigate to figure out where the lead is coming from. If it's in the lead solder and copper pipes, those are kind of hard to replace. If it's in the trunk lines, you're not going to replace those. If it's in the faucets, those are replaceable. So you, there's some things you can do to substitute. Yes? Um, there's one recommendation I've seen from the EPA to run your faucet for, I think it's like up to like two, three minutes before, before you, you collect the water. No. How effective is that? Uh, you run the faucet so as to flush lead or any other contaminants right. out of there that would have leached overnight to make it more potable. Um, so um, or you I, think, sitting off for a while. I think that helps. I used to not do that because I wanted to conserve water and then yeah. I said, geez, actually That's I don't want, help. since I re now realize that lead is virtually everywhere, mm -hmm. I tend to try to let the faucet run for right. 30 seconds or a minute. Right. I think it helps knock down. Uh, when you test for lead, they actually say, don't do that. Take the very first yes, draw, right. first thing in the morning, because the water's been sitting in the pipes all yeah. night. Um, so it probably helps somewhat. There's probably some data out there. I'm not sure. It probably helps. So are you only worried about the, so you the water you drink, not the water you shower in? Um, that's a good question. There are some contaminants in water that would be a concern in, in showering. Lead is probably not one of them. Yeah. Because it probably, I don't think it, there would be dermal exposure to the skin, and um, it's not very, um, it's not really volatile. It wouldn't become vapor, so you wouldn't tend to breathe it. Um, there was the state uh, main center for disease control and prevention, CDC, recently did a study on arsenic. I'm going to talk about arsenic here in well water, and um, they concluded that probably bathing and showering using uh, water drawn from a uh, household well that is high in arsenic is probably not a major contributor to arsenic exposure. It's probably the ingestion of the water itself in cooking and drinking. So um, Maine has the highest per capita dependence on groundwater for drinking of any state in the country. About half our population draws its drinking water from so-called private wells or household wells. And um, in a great loophole, uh, uh, household wells are exempt from the state and federal Safe Drinking Water Acts. There's no regulation, there's no enforcement. We do have federal drinking water and health standards, and for every one of these contaminants, these five contaminants, uh, there are many wells in the state of Maine uh, that violate those federal health standards, except uh, they're not legally enforceable for groundwater. So we know health hazards are presented, um, but there's very little being done about it. In fact, um, fewer than half 
of the residents in Maine that have wells have even tested for these suite of contaminants. They're unaware of the nature of the problem. So it's a very serious problem. Um, and just as one example, <coughs> arsenic, here are the uh, counties in Maine. And um, on average, it shows the percent of wells tested in those counties that are above the federal health standard of uh, 10 micrograms of arsenic per, per liter of water, which is uh, parts per billion. Uh, so you see, um, uh, can, uh, this might be by public health district. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's by public health. That's by county. By county. Hancock County, Kennebec County are very high. Uh, there's another hot spot sort of in, in York area as well. Um, But no, uh, no, uh, there's some, I forget the number now, there's uh, well over 150 main towns that have wells that have been tested that came back elevated in arsenic. And why is that? So that's, that's shocking. This day and age, 100,000 Mainers that don't have safe drinking water, that's, that really is a violation of basic human rights. And so a lot more needs to be done by government and the private sector to get a handle on this problem. It's not a new problem. But there is new data. Uh, three years ago, two years ago, a peer-reviewed journal article was published. They recruited almost 300 kids from main school districts. And they um, uh, measured, they had well water testing data and um, used sophisticated, sensitive measures of cognitive ability and concluded that um, those young children with the highest levels of arsenic in their drinking water had measurable uh, decrements in, in IQ points, like five to six IQ points lower. Which, you know, as an, on an individual basis, you know, if, if one of us has is five points less intelligent, it's not doesn't seem like a big deal. But if you look at the bell curve or the spread across the population, it shifts the whole curve so that we have fewer uh, gifted uh, students at the high end and, and more uh, you know, seriously cognitively deficit children at the lower end. And it has a significant on a population basis. Also, arsenic is a known human carcinogen, cancer-causing agent. It's demonstrably been demonstrated. Um, uh, Maine is not alone in the United States in having high arsenic. Uh, there are some other parts of the world that have even higher arsenic, uh, like Bangladesh where some of these first studies were done. But just this year, the National uh, Cancer Institute published a study uh, showing that the bladder cancer rates in northern New England were associated with higher levels of arsenic in the drinking water. So we, we actually have some human health data. So this is an issue we're working on. Uh, we had legislation last year that the governor vetoed. Uh, the governor also denied uh, federal funds that were available to promote education outreach to raise awareness to improve well testing. But we'll be back in the state legislature uh, next year in January to pass pass the public policy. Does the city of Portland drinking water that gets it from Sebago Lake, do they are they required to like test the water from the lake yes. regularly, annually or yeah, public they public water regularly? supplies uh, are mandated to do regular testing. You can ask to see the test results. I think usually they mail them to yeah, the residents. Yeah. Smaller public water systems maybe are a little shakier in terms of um, monitoring requirements. And one gap is that um, schools are not mandated to test their water supply, uh, even though something like lead coming out of the water coolers is a real issue in a lot of schools. Yeah. You have an increased risk of bladder, skin, and lung cancer, yep. but isn't arsenic also in cigarettes? Uh, yes, Those it is. Contribute. To that type of cancer. Yes, yes they do. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things in environmental public health is that you have certain um, general diseases that have multiple causes. It's very hard to tease it's apart. Yeah, but um, in, in a number of these studies they have um, control for variables to parse apart the association. It's the rare case that you have a truly sentinel disease that unequivocally can be related. So for example, mesothelioma, a cancer of the lining of the, the lung, 
is uniquely associated with asbestos exposure. Or there's a very rare cancer called angiosarcoma, cancer of the liver. It's pretty much only associated with vinyl chloride exposure in the workplace. But that those kind of um, sentinel diseases are more rare. More typically, you have a common disease. Skin cancer is very common. Ultraviolet radiation from the sun, unprotected on your skin, is the major source. But we know our safety is a significant contributor as well. And in some cases, dermatologists are warning their patients to test their their wells for arsenic. Yeah. So uh, these are very familiar lead, uh, arsenic. These are very familiar public health issues. We start to move into more recent concerns. How many people have heard of BPA? Most people. Um, bisphenol A. It's a um, it's a building block chemical used to make polycarbonate plastic. It's also a ingredient in the manufacture of epoxy, most epoxy resins. And epoxy resins are used to, to, they're the most popular lining for the inside of cans and the inside of metal jar lids. Uh, BPA came to the fore uh, almost 10 years ago when uh, concerned moms uh, became aware of the issue and the science associating uh, uh, BPA in plastic baby bottles and infant formula cans uh, with high, relatively high exposure to infants. Um, BPA is an estrogen mimicking compound. It's, a, it's in a broad class of chemicals known as uh, endocrine disrupting compounds, EDCs. These are chemicals that um, act like or interfere with natural hormones in the body, typically at exquisitely low doses because that is at the level that natural hormones are active. And so um, the concern with BPA is, uh, in terms of the health concern, is it's associated with uh, exposure during pregnancy and early childhood especially, is associated with um, uh, harm to brain development, um, it's associated with um, uh, adverse effects on the prostate, um, and also adverse effects on behavior. So brain and, and um, uh, um, sexual organs, genitals, and um, now it is out of um, baby bottles. It's out of um, infant formula cans. In fact, most infant formula, you can't buy in cans anymore. It's in plastic or it's powder. And it's out of um, the jar lids of baby food. However, it's still in food cans. A recent survey found that about two thirds of all food cans are still lined with epoxy resin. And you can measure BPA in the food. Question or comment or no? How do you know which cans have it and which ones don't? You don't. It's not generally labeled. I mean, there are a few manufacturers that uh, will say BPA free on the label. So, uh, uh, buy a can of beans from Eden Foods, it'll say BPA free on the label. But um, that is part of the problem. There's no disclosure. We've, our right to know is not really being honored. And um, a number of people are looking, searching for alternatives. But the industry, the food industry, is not moving quickly enough. Yes. Is, it, is it all um, glass, is it for glass jars, like glass uh, jars? Uh, Pretty much. Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm not absolutely certain, but the mason jars do have a gasket, like a rubberized gasket. gasket. And um, these food contact uh, materials are known to leach chemicals into the food. Um, this, um, this type of glass uh, metal lid uh, likely has more food contact than the mason jar because the mason jar is just the gasket between the, the caps, whereas this is an open lid. Um, but it could be a source. Yeah. I have a question about the labeling for BPA-free. Yeah. If it says BPA-free, is there a regulation to trust that it is, or can mm -hmm. anyone just write that? Uh, not strictly speaking, but um, increasingly, um, the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, they have something called their Green Guidelines. And now it's a bit more, the consequences of um, lying in the marketplace uh, in a label is more consequential. So there could be consequence for um, being untruthful in the label. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not universally required or police. So, um, I'll move on. Uh, there's, so there's more work to do on BPA. It's complicated uh, developing and finding 
incentivizing the safer alternatives. Oh, one last thing. Almost all receipts these days are so-called thermal receipt paper. Uh, there's not actually a printer with ink that prints those. There's um, high temperature at the end of the print uh, heads um, react with the chemicals in the paper to bring out color. That's the common technology for most receipts. And this final A is used in the chemistry of thermal receipt paper to enable the color to come out upon application of heat at the print head. And this is a big problem. And um, because particularly if you're a cash register, you have measurably higher occupational exposure to BPA uh, than other folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've stopped asking for receipts. I need, I need a few for reimbursement, but uh, increasingly they're electronic available or you don't need them. Um, some manufacturers have switched to a, uh, a cousin chemical called BPS, bisphenol S, which is also uh, believed to have similar uh, hormone disrupting properties. It's been less studied, so that's not a, a real solution either. Yeah? How easy, easily absorbable is BPA in your skin? Relatively easily. Um, uh, I don't recall what the metrics are offhand, but cash registers handling cash receipts all shift will increase, you'll, you can measure increased amounts of BPA in their blood. In the yeah. So it's from handling. Yeah. And then occasionally, you know, kids play with it, kids put their hands in their mouth or suck on it, so it can be childhood exposure as well. So um, I want to keep moving. Uh, you know, here's a very general approach to plastics. Um, you might recall the, the recycling triangle and code that you see on a lot of plastics. It doesn't cover all polymers that are out there. It was originally established to facilitate recycling. These plastics are relatively cleaner, high density, low density polyethylene and polypropylene, some products that contain them. Uh, they're still petrochemical based, they're still oil based but they tend to have, fewer, to have fewer additives and the basic building blocks used to make the plastics don't tend to leach into the environment or product. Um, new plastics are bio-based. This, um, actually the new Stonyfield Farm uh, small yogurts, the very thin plastic, are PLA. This is a, um, most PLA is made from Midwestern corn right now. We're actually working on a project that someday could uh, enable uh, Maine to convert forest products, wood chips, into the building blocks that would make this bio-based PLA as an advanced material. Most of it's corn-based in the U.S. It's a green, it's an inherently green chemistry. In fact, it won a Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award when it was invented. And at the end of its useful life, it's compostable. It can be returned to nutrients for the soil. So those are relatively safe plastics. These are relatively poison plastics, especially PVC, polyvinyl chloride, sometimes called vinyl the number three plastic. It uh, takes two carcinogens to make it, um, and they have to, because it is full of chlorine, it's naturally self-corrosive. It would eat itself apart. So they pump it full of stabilizers. Historically, they've used lead and cadmium as a stabilizer. Now they use tin, organotin. And it's pumped to make it flexible. They pump it through what are called plasticizers, including phthalates, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So it's full of toxic additives. Terrible uh, life cycle uh, and one of the top volume plastics in the world, PVC, they grow. Uh, polycarbonate is made with bisphenol A. Uh, polystyrene is made with styrene, it's carcinogen. Uh, so um, again, there are other polymers out there, but this is a rough guide to uh, uh, rule of thumb for plastics, try to avoid or choose. And then let's talk about phthalates. So phthalates are used to soften plastics particularly vinyl. I'm going to drill down a little deeper here while we have time uh, just to uh, give you an example of the complexity of this. These chemicals are uh, produced 12 billion pounds a year are produced globally. Um, we've known about their hazards for a long time. When I started doing this work quite a while ago, 35 years ago, phthalates were a concern, or well, they're still a concern. Um, there's now a ro robust uh, and growing body of scientific evidence. We're particularly concerned about their effects during development. So uh, exposure during pregnancy 
in early childhood, uh, but there can be effects at any age. Uh, we chemistry buffs. The phthalates are, this is a, a phthalic acid um, basic structure, a benzene ring with two carboxylic acid rings. And the R's are referred to hydrocarbon chains that can vary in length. Thus, you get a whole family of chemicals known as orthophthalates, ortho, this being ortho position. Uh, and so um, there's 20 or so that are produced in high volume still in the United States. There might be 30 to 40 that are in commerce. And um, as it turns out, this is typical. We know more about some of their hazards and a lot less about some of the others, but they're all in the same family. So we need to, to as a precautionary measure, address the entire class uh, similarly. It turns out that this unique structure uh, enables the uh, molecule to interfere with the production of androgens, which are male sex hormones, including testosterone. And they also mess up thyroid hormones. And that's the mechanism by which their toxic effects are generated. They're used everywhere. Consumer goods, plastic sheets, vinyl flooring. Uh, most wallpaper is vinyl these days. The, the, the sheet, the plastic sheets, the wire and cable. Uh, coated fabrics, the, the, uh, the kind of silk screen plastic -y images on kids' clothing, vinyl, uh, contain phthalates, and, and, and other pieces. Uh, and uh, there's widespread exposure. The, the U.S. CDC runs the National uh, Biomonitoring Program, where every two years they go out and sample a representative group of 5,000 Americans and ask them a bunch of questions, take some blood, urine, and they, they test for chemicals. And it's a, it's a truly, it's done in a statistically significant way to be representative. And uh, they have concluded that somewhere in the order of 95% of all Americans uh, have phthalates in their body. And we know phthalates, uh, unlike other chemicals, don't uh, bioaccumulate. They don't build up in your body. So what you measure, what we would measure today, say in our urine, the metabolites of phthalates, reflects what we're exposed to yesterday, today, pretty much. So we're exposed every day to phthalates. And these are different phthalates, uh, the acronyms, uh, and these are um, measured amounts of micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day exposure and uh, to different subgroups. And um, you know, there's, a, there's a debate, and as you get into these chemicals, you quickly learn that there's raging debates about you know, is there a safe level of exposure? Is there an acceptable level of risk? And the old um, regulatory toxicology model argues that there is, for everything, there's a safe level of exposure. It's the quote, the dose makes the poison. And certainly, there is a dose response. The more you're exposed to, the greater the risk, the greater the likely impact. But increasingly, uh, professionals like at the Endocrine Society, which is the professional association of endocrinologists, believe that there's no safe level of exposure to endocrine active compounds because in our bodies, our hormones are uh, active at exquisitely tiny doses. So any exogenous or outside foreign hormone-like chemical will also activate or deactivate those biological systems at very low doses. Also, the National Academy of Sciences uh, did a report uh, called Science and Decisions in 2008 to uh, uh, examine what's wrong with risk assessment as it's practiced today for chemical hazards. They noted that Across the human population, there's a 10,000-fold variability in our susceptibility to the effects of toxic chemicals. That's because our genetic makeup is very different. Our nutritional status is very different. There are psychosocial risk factors related to poverty and racism and domestic abuse that make people more susceptible to chemical effects. So there's a huge variability in the human population. So if you're talking about exposure on a population-wide basis, somebody is going to be at high risk. There's virtually no safe level of exposure. Nonetheless, um, for the phthalates individually, somewhere between 10 and 50 micrograms per kilogram per day is the conventional um, uh, uh, acceptable daily intake or presumed reference dose or, or threshold. 
and you can see that some people are exposed collectively to these phthalates at levels above uh, what's presumed to be a, a safe level exposure. In fact, um, uh, yeah. And, and the other thing that's interesting about toxicology is, is uh, we have all three lines of evidence. Uh, epi studies, epidemiological studies, animal toxicity studies, and, we, and, and laboratory research on the mechanisms by which this is happening. They're all in alignment for phthalates. That's unusual. That makes it a, a relatively robust understanding. And so we see all kinds of effects on male reproductive health and brain from prenatal exposure. Immune function is a new area. Um, so we see undescended testes, which are a risk factor for testicular cancer. Um, these birth defects of the penis. The shorter anogenital distance is an obscure measure, but it's been documented in humans exposed to higher levels of phthalates in the womb. And basically what you're seeing in baby boys by this measure is that they are being feminized in a way, biologically. That it, because they are starved of testosterone during early development, um, their uh, genitals are more female-like. Um, and it can affect fertility as well. Uh, so more uh, you know, behavioral changes, this, this is the brain. The effects on brain development, we don't, that could be related to thyroid. Low thyroid is associated with brain development problems, but also it turns out testosterone is very important for brain development for both males and females. So it could be related to, to testosterone. Um, and then childhood exposure, we're also seeing studies that show these effects. Later in childhood, similar effects, effects on reproductive health. through these in just the time. Immune function is a little less understood, um, but it does seem to be um, a mechanism by which um, people are more susceptible to allergies and asthmas. Um, here, here are some trends in exposure. Um, some phthalates are going down in, um, this is relative, so you see the, yeah, concentration in, uh, this would probably be in, in urine, I think. But some other phthalates are going up. So we're seeing some progress. Actually, these ones, these two are being promoted as an alternative to this one. But they have similar health effects. They're just a little bit less potent. So that's a case of regrettable substitution where the industry prefers a solution that's just a milder version of the same problem rather than an inherently safer alternative. And that's a, that's a struggle. That's the report I mentioned in the NS report. Oh, another NS report, actually. Um, this is the um, report to the US Consumer Product Safety Commission by an expert uh, science panel known as the Chronic Hazard Advisory Panel. They concluded that 10% of pregnant women and 5% of infants are exposed to quote, unsafe levels of valleys today, even though there may not be a safe level. Uh, they have proposed extending their ban on phthalates in toys and child care articles. But it turns out, I don't have slides on this yet, but it turns out that um, the diet, our diet is the major source of phthalate exposure. And this is a, a new campaign nationally that we're developing with partners to challenge major food manufacturers. They don't add the phthalates, it's not a direct food additive, they don't add it to the, as an ingredient, but it comes out of uh, food processing the conveyor belts, the plastic tubing, the flanges and seals, the films, the vinyl gloves that the food workers use. All these different food contact materials leach phthalates, or phthalates escape from them, and they get into the food supply. And then also food packaging. It's in, uh, uh, you know, one of the substitutes for BPA in the can windings is vinyl, and they leach phthalates into the food. Uh, phthalates are also in the inks, in printer food labels, they're in the adhesives, in the paperboard cartons used to package food, they're in the lacquer coatings that make the boxes shiny, and they, they don't stay in any of these products, they're not chemically bound, so they'll come out and get into the food. There's probably also environmental contamination. So it's a big food issue, a, uh, a bunch of organizations have petitioned the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to, to prohibit this, it's prohibited largely in Europe. They're deliberating on that petition, and, and uh, 
sometime around next month, we're going to send letters to about 20 major food manufacturers around the country asking them to investigate, identify, and eliminate systematically the sources of phthalates that are contaminating our food supply. So it's a big campaign coming up. In that. This is just a bit, a bit of complications on the regulatory status. Don't have time to go into that. This is the phthalate that ExxonMobil Chemical Corporation makes that they want to say is the alternative. They're offering a phthalate as an alternative to a phthalate. We say, no, that doesn't make sense. And actually, we got, as part of the coalition, we convinced um, the Home Depot, the world's fifth largest retailer, to exit all phthalates in vinyl flooring. And when they announced that decision, working with their suppliers, all the other home improvement stores followed suit. So that one corporate decision basically flipped the flooring market worldwide phthalate free, showing the, the power of the marketplace when these guys act, well ahead of any regulation. So, and what they rejected was DIMP as a, as a substitute. A couple more things, I, we're out of time almost, but here's some resources on safer products. HealthyStuff.org is a good one. Um, the Good Guide is still out there. Also, I'm part of a national campaign called the Mind the Store campaign, where we're challenging the big box retailers um, to uh, work with their suppliers to get the toxic chemicals out of the products on their shelves. Basically, the, the government safety system is broken, and so just because you bought it in a store doesn't mean it's safe. Um, and we're at time, but there are other things we could talk about another time. Stain resistant chemicals, yes. Yeah. So, do you have a recommended um, materials for storage for like glass or aluminum? Or, uh, that's for packaging? Yeah, for like storage, like in the fridge, but yeah. heating, you know. Glass, preferably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, there's been a number of EPI studies done. Um, the less processed the food is and the less packaged the food is, the lower your exposure to these chemical additives. Um, BPA, phthalates, and other, there are other chemicals as well. Uh, we, you know, in terms of system reform, we need to get the chemicals out of food processing and packaging, but in the meantime, you can opt for fresher, less processed, less packaged foods, and uh, you know, preferentially use glass or polyethylene containers, be relatively safer than containers. So we don't have time to talk about the Teflon chemicals, but another group, flame retardants. There, there are many other chemicals. Um, we have a law in Maine, the Kids Safe Products Act, that's doing a little bit to take care of this problem slowly. And um, you can get involved. We have internships and volunteer opportunities. You can call Emily at our office here in Portland, or go to our website and sign up for our newsletter and uh, stay abreast of some of these issues and opportunities to get involved. So I don't know if we, I have time for questions or comments if people want to talk further about I know we're at our scheduled time. Let's talk about cooking in Teflon pans. Yes, I would avoid that. Yeah. Uh, te um, Teflon is um, it's um, tetrafluoroethylene. It's like a polyethylene, which is relatively clean, except it has four fluorine uh, molecules. Uh, uh, not molecules, but atoms attached to the molecule. And the fluorine carbon bond is the strongest chemical bond known to exist. And so what that means is anything that is fluorinated will be extremely persistent in the environment. It basically, it will never break down. With the problem with Teflon uh, pans, or Gore-Tex for that matter, which is a expanded <coughs> Teflon with air bubbles or holes blown through it, is the chemicals used to manufacture it. Uh, you can have a little bit of shedding of chemicals from those products themselves. In the case of uh, Teflon coated pans, if you overheat the pan, it'll put off a toxic gas, which came to people's attention because it was killing pet birds. Pet birds were extremely sensitive. I don't know if it was a hydrogen fluoride gas or some type of, um, you know, when you actually burn the pan. But it turns out the, the Teflon chemicals are in a, they're in a whole family of chemicals um, that are used, basically most everything that is stain resistant, water repellent, grease resistant, are treated with this broad family of fluorinated 
perfluorinated compounds or PFCs. So yeah. Gore-Tex is not good for you then? You know, Gore-Tex itself is relatively inert, but the process used to make it and the family of chemistry that it's in is extremely problematic. And um, the outdoor clothing industry, which depends on um, durable water repellency, is under a lot of pressure to switch to non-fluorinated alternatives, and there's a lot of activity right now. You may have heard of PFOA and PFOS. These are a couple of the chemicals that are showing up in groundwater. Yeah. So what would you recommend to use for like, our rainbow? Would you recommend like wearing something under such a skin? Or? Well, there is, I mean, it is, it is challenging. Uh, I'm going to be in the market for some outdoor gear pretty soon, and I'm going to have to look pretty hard. You can ask now. There are some new entries into the market that are fluorine-free or PFC-free. Well, you have to ask. And then um, there are also, um, uh, you know, nylon polyurethane combination. It doesn't have the long life of, uh, of a Gore-Tex or, or perfluorinated treatment, but it, it does give you water repellency. Uh, but it, it's challenging. So we're on the cutting edge of trying to put on safer materials. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I didn't go heavily into that, but personal care products, well, for one thing, um, there's a phthalates issue there. Uh, you know, personal care products, the major ingredients have to be uh, printed on the label. Usually the last ingredient is fragrance. Fragrance is actually a collection. It could be anywhere from 5 to 10 to 100 different chemicals, almost always phthalates are in the fragrance, one particular phthalate called DDP. It's used as a carrier solvent to carry the other ingredients. So um, we had, um, we did biomonitoring testing in Maine and uh, Paige Holmes who volunteered with us to have her um, give us a urine sample so we could measure for phthalates. She had the highest level of DDP and it was probably from her makeup and other personal care products. So um, that's not the only concern. Uh, you can go to, um, you can check out the um, Campaign for Safe Cosmetics. It has a lot of information on personal care products. Um, there's also a database called Skin Deep that the Environmental Working Group does that um, characterizes the um, chemical ingredients of personal care products and rates products on a you know, green to red scale. Um, okay. Here's another example. Yeah, Anything that's, that doesn't have an essential oil in it. Fabric softener in general, candles, all of those are all. Okay. Pretty much most synth most fragrance, most synthetic fragrance is problematic. Not, not only because of phthalates, but some of the other ingredients that actually impart the fragrance, petrochemical based, are extremely problematic for health and the environment. So they're suspect certainly, and of course some people are just hyposensitive to uh, chemical odors or uh, allergens, chemical allergens, uh, and they know they need to avoid um, those fragrances. But they're also a source of exposure to all of us. It could be a long-term health concern. Yeah? Sorry, just a quick question. I feel like for infant care and cribs, they say, yeah. I know there are some companies that have like phthalate-free or PVC-free yep. cribs, but those that don't, they claim if you buy it in advance and air it out for a couple of months, that reduces it, but what is the, I mean, is it true that if you air it out, it's reducing the phthalates, the Yeah, the phthalates are not chemically bound in the plastic, so they will continuously shed. And but is there who wants to have a product that continuously sheds low levels of chemicals? Well, that's what I was going to say. So they say yeah. like one to two months, but it could continue after that, yeah, after, it'll continue. not just a one to two month window. Yeah, there'll be some kind of exponential decay curve. Okay, that's good to know. Thank uh, you. Okay. So you know, a thing, a thing like um, the phthalates are added in percent quantity. So a beach ball, thin skin beach ball, yeah. that's about 35 percent phthalates okay. to make it that flexible. The more flexible it is, the more phthalates. So that's a very high percentage of a, of a material that's not chemically bound continually. Semi-volatile, so it won't come off as a gas all of a sudden, but little bits come okay. off Over all time. the time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And the cosmetics, as I was going to mention, um, I mean, our whole chemical safety system in different respects, governmentally, is broken, but 
for cosmetics, the industry self-regulates itself. There's a panel called the Cosmetic Ingredient Review Panel. Sounds like an important government regulator. No, it's actually the industry panel, and they self-regulate themselves. And now there's legislation in Congress, and uh, our Senator Susan Collins is a co-sponsor that would reform uh, that part of our federal system to bring cosmetic ingredients under more safe, formal safety scrutiny. But the additives I talked about in the food, like phthalates, there's more than 10,000, I was told 13,000 on Friday, food additives that have never been certified for safety that are in our food, either deliberately added or they get in the food, like phthalates, from process infection. So FDA is hopelessly behind on that task and ill-equipped. So we do need government reform, but we also need educated consumers in the marketplace that are demanding uh, safer alternatives because the companies do respond ultimately to their customers. ExxonMobil won't respond, but you know a consumer product company will start offering you know phthalate free and BPA free products as consumers demand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Enjoy talking to you.